everyone, and welcome to another episode of ECHOA. ECHOA is an inspiring, informative, and international webinar series by Global University Systems that brings to you some of the most interesting businesses and business leaders from across the globe. Our topic today is high fashion to the House of Lords, and we're joined by Baroness Verma, UK a politician and a member of the House of Lords. Baroness Verma has been a member of the House of Lords since 2006 and has previously served as Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for the Department of International Development. Today, we'll explore what it takes to be a politician and we'll also take a look at some of the avenues you can take to get into politics. We'll also get some insights into the work Baroness Verma has carried out, um, championing equality and gender issues and understand the importance of playing an active role in the community. Baroness Verma, a very warm welcome and we're so excited to have you here. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. We're so thrilled. Baroness Verma, before we start, we have this tradition here at, uh, at Aircoa where we talk about one of the Gus values. And I would like to tease out one of those values and hear what your thoughts are on integrity. What does integrity mean to you? So it's a really good word because in today's world, you can see that there are a lot of connotations around integrity. And I think what it should mean is that if you say something that you're going to do or deliver on, you do it with honesty and with respect for the person involved or with the group involved or the organisation involved. So for me, integrity means I will partake in something knowing that I'm being honest about whatever I'm going to do. A lovely way to start. Thank mm. you, Baroness. To our viewers, do send questions for Baroness Verma in the live chat box and we'll come back to you during the Q&A session. So let's dive straight in. Uh, and one of the key questions or most exciting questions that all of us students have is you have a career in politics that spans over two decades. Uh, could you talk us through your journey as a politician? So I can, and although the formal part of my politics is just over two decades, actually my interest in politics has been, as far as I can remember, it goes back to my teenage years and before, simply because as growing up in a country where there were very few people that actually looked like me at the time, one of the things that you were subjected to quite a lot was racism on the basis of your colour of the skin. And, and so I sort of grew fighting my corner. Maybe I didn't know it in the formal sense of politics, but I did know it that it was something that I had to stand up for. So I, I suppose I can say I've been engaged in activism of some kind or another for a very, very, very long time. Did you always know you wanted to become a politician? I know you said that you've been active in it at a very young age, at a very mm. early stage, um, especially when you were in education. Did you, did you know that this is what you want to do one day? Yeah, so I, 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 I often say to people, when, when people ask me what do I want to do when I grow up, um, one of my school essays was I wanted to be Prime Minister of India. And the, f the reason it was Prime Minister of India was because I didn't think as a person of colour I could be Prime Minister of this country. And the only person I saw as a role model was the Prime Minister of India at the time, was Indira Gandhi, who was a female, a strong woman. So I think, you know, yes, I, I think I've always had an interest in doing something disruptive. Um, I do, I know the term disruptive comes with all sorts of, um, meanings today but I think for me generally I have been quite a disruptor from quite a long long time just like, to shake the status quo really I like the term disruptor it's, it's mm. being a force of change yeah it is and I think you can I think you just got to believe enough in yourself to be able to believe that you can be the, the force of change as you've rightly said um, but you know it is something that I, I'm, I'm passionate about and if I'm passionate about something then I feel I can do it Absolutely. You've already mentioned um, why you want to become a politician, like Indra Gandhi was one of your role models and you thought you wouldn't be able to become a politician here in this country. It's representation, a lack of representation was one of the reasons. So my next question to you would be, as an Indian British politician who has moved to the UK as a child, how important is diversity within the political landscape in the UK? And how can diversity be promoted in the workplace by all of us? So it's really, really important. And, that, and these are key, key questions that we should really be asking ourselves. Why haven't we made enough progress? Why is it that we've got third, maybe fourth generation people here now, and maybe even longer, and we still haven't got the type of representation, not just in politics, but in every single institution at senior level that represents people like you and I? Why is it that we're still fighting the battles of those days gone by 
And in fact, in some places, I think we've actually gone backwards. So, so you know, we, we can talk the talk, but unfortunately, we still haven't managed to walk the walk. And I think we do need to challenge ourselves to challenge the systems a bit more. Um, one of the... You mentioned about being passionate about mm. what you do. So I would like to explore your work championing equality and uh, gender issues a bit further. How important is it to pursue avenues uh, that you feel passionate about? Uh, and how can students build on the work that you have done and play an active role in championing uh, equality? So the, the, for me, the thing is very simple. If everybody does not have access to the same opportunity in life, regardless of their postcode, regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, regardless of their ability or disability, I feel that we are in a, a world that is poorer for the ability of that talent to come through. Now, I can't change the world on my own. Nobody can singularly, but we can all play our part. And some of it is that we don't allow things to go unsaid, unchallenged, or we accept that this is inevitable so we can't do anything about it. There is no inevitability in life. You know, we've all got an opportunity to change something. I wasn't born in a political family. I decided to do what I'm doing because I just couldn't stand those people who purported to stand up and speak on my behalf. And so I think you need to take the decision, am I going to wait for somebody else to do it? Or am I going to be the person who's going to start the chain of events and let people join the train? Somebody starting the chain of events. I guess one of the proudest moments in your life, with all, a lot of, I'm sure there have been a lot of proud moments, it must have been when you were appointed chair of the UN Women UK Committee, um, where you served for three years from 2018. Um, was this a moment in your career where you felt all your hard work as ministerial champion for tackling violence against women and girls overseas was starting to get recognised? So look, the, first of all, I don't do anything in my life for recognition. But I've been very fortunate. I've been in the right place, right time, for and right people around me to do things. Um, being chair of UN Women UK, I'm still the chair. I've got another three years of it because I was elected to serve another three. It gives me a platform to raise issues that I've always championed. I drive change. I'm, a, I'm one of those figures that does transformational change. It's sometimes painful. But unfortunately, if we have to go through pain to get a better outcome, so be it. But I am also incredibly proud of the fact that in my 20s, I was on a refuge as a non-executive um, to see at first hand the sort of abuse that was given from one human being to another. And that really shaped why I wouldn't stand by and let abuse happen and stand up and speak up about it. So I think there are so many points in your life that happen to be the point that you say, right, I've now achieved this, what's next? So being chair of UN Women is just another part of my journey. Mm -hmm. I will stop doing what I do when I know that I don't need to do it anymore. And we hope you still continue doing it because the world needs more people like you. I, well, I, yeah. well, I do hope, but on your point, Jackson, I want the world to not have to need people like me because the, the need for people like me is to stop people doing things to other people that are actually unnecessary because of the way society allows us to do them. So we have to change societal norms, and the only way we can do that is by changing ourselves. Mm. You mentioned that it's not always been easy, along the lines, something along the lines. Mm. Um, so uh, career in politics has as many highs and lows. How important is it to find a way that works for you to recover from the lows so you can get the most from your highs? Uh, for instance, what advice would you give to students who face rejection? And that's a, a really good question because, you know, nobody ever sees the lows. They always see the, the bit that you've achieved and you're celebrated for the things you've achieved, but nobody sees the the difficult journeys that you have to make. And I always say to people that, you know, I've got two really best, good best friends, confidence and commitment. Those are my best buddies. And when I start to wane on either one of them, I remind myself why I'm doing it. And, you know, of course we're going to have lows, but you surround yourself with people that are of a positive outlook like you are. 
that actually optimism and, and the ability to change things does take time. But it, if you prevail, it will happen. And I always, always know that for every one person who's there to push me back, there'll be nine people there who will encourage me forward. But you have to keep the company you enjoy rather than the company you think you need. And the company you enjoy will be always the ones who encourage you to do more. And I think it's, it's, it's that simple. We tie too often to impress people we don't need to impress. What you need to do is to enjoy the company of the people that you know will share your, your gains, your, your wins, and also be there to lift you up when you sometimes don't get them. On the point of lifting you up, uh, when, when some people sometimes don't get you, um, motivation is one of the key things that we all struggle with at times. Um, you have already shown your capacity to balance life as a businesswoman and as, uh, as a parliamentarian. We'll come back to the question, uh, to the point of businesswoman. Uh, but what tips can you give to students who are following this webinar today uh, surrounding important skills such as time management, organisation and motivation? So time management, don't ask me, <laughs> because I have, I am so bad at actually managing my time. However, I think passion is a good driver for everyone. And so if you enjoy doing something, actually it doesn't matter how many hours you put in. Um, but on, on, on other things, the skills you need to know, I think all I always say to people is do things that you enjoy doing and have a passion for doing. And if you are having to force yourself to do something, you're never going to conclude it. Um, it becomes a chore rather than you know something that you're going to actually want to see an, the end result of. Yeah. Um, but I also think that knowing that I am part of a, a big piece in the machinery that will bring good change always keeps me inspired. I meet some of the most inspirational people every day of my life and they just wow me over and I just think my god if only I had a little bit of that I'd be able to do even more there are so many good things going on around you but we tend to focus too much on the negative and I think what we need to do is search out for the the really good stuff and and focus on that but on time management yeah you need to I think I think the problem for me is I've been doing it for so long, and until I feel that there is enough people doing the change, um, my time management is always going to be poor. <laughs> so. At the end of the day, everything gets done. It you, gets you, done. You, you make sure to get it yeah. done. And I, I, I'm, matters. I, I do get yeah. things done, and, and, and I never take on things that I don't think I can do. And I also think that you must never, ever promise and under-deliver just promise that you'll do your best at it. It's mm. a very good advice. Very mm. piece of advice. Um, now we know that you're a parliamentarian, but you also got you're also a businesswoman. Um, you've not only really shown your abilities within politics, but you have a strong entrepreneurial side. Uh, you started your business at the age of eight, age of nineteen in high fashion. Can you tell us a bit more about your ventures outside of politics and any advice you would give to students? who are planning on starting their own business. Yeah, I think, I mean, entrepreneurialism runs in <laughs> in my blood. And I'm so happy because my son, my daughter, everybody um, uh, is in business. And I just think that sometimes you have such a brilliant idea. It's always going to be challenging in the beginning, but never give up. Yeah. You know, I, I always say I'm good at the creative part, but then I need somebody who's very good at the finance bit and I need somebody who's good at the sort of managerial operational piece. And so you find people to complement what you're doing. Never be frightened of sharing. I, and, you know, it's easy to want to have the whole pie and eat it. But actually, the whole pie could be value zero, where I would rather have a pie which maybe I can get 25, 30 percent out of but it's a big pie. Yeah. So, so I, and I also think, do your homework. Look at what it is you're going into business for and look at what your competitors are doing and always look for an exit strategy. Most people stay in a business for far too long mm -hmm. and don't exit out. And you, your best bet is go in with a good business plan and also with a good exit strategy plan. But that was about business. Now, let's say a student's interested uh, to have a career in politics. Mm. Like, what skills 
do they need to aim to develop and what advice would you give them to do so? Well, you've got to like people first. <laughs> um, you've got to be able to like people. You've got to be able to like to be able to be challenged on things mm. because not your, your belief systems may not just be the belief systems of everybody around you. You know, and so you, 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 it's 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 taking the the rough and the and the smooth together. Um, I also think you need to know what it is you want to do in politics. I mean, I've always been driven by in inclusiveness, equality, looking at gender, looking at racism, sustainability. I mean, you know, I am a huge fan of making the world a better place, and I know I won't be able to do it by myself. And I know the institutions are still not 21st century ready. We still live in institutions that have been there from the 18th, 19th, 20th century. And the movement is very slow. But if we want to really see a world where everybody gets a good opportunity, then our institutions have got to be changing. Um, that's a good point that institutions have got to be changing. Mm -hmm. And to students who are watching, do some questions in for Barnes Mama. Don't be shy. Send in your questions. This is your opportunity to ask questions directly and, and talk about change and what you want to see in the community. Um, to many students following this webinar today who would like to replicate the success you have had in your career, how important was education to your success? And what advice would you give uh, to students to make the most out of the education? So, so there are two big points there. I, When I was growing up unfortunately culturally girls were not encouraged to go to higher education and I was taken out in the middle of my A-levels um, to, to, to get married. That was fine. It was culturally done, culturally accepted. I also believe very firmly that there is education is good for some and some is people just enjoy going knee deep in and, and doing it from le learning what life throws at them. And neither of them is right and neither of them is wrong. The only thing that education allows you to do is to perhaps be a bit more analytical about what you're doing. But that also then poses a point, to me sometimes a worrying point, is if you overanalyze anything, then you actually start to, uh, to, to control your, your internal sort of initiative, your, your, in, you know, your, in, your intuition suddenly starts to flake. Yeah. And I think what you need to do is to be confident enough to say, this is a great idea, I want to go with this, but maybe I do need some, some educational backup behind it. So like, for instance, I have two children. One has done a double master's. One was very clear and said, I don't want to go to university. I would prefer to, you give me the money, I want to put it into a business, fail or, or succeed, I want to do that. Yeah. Neither were wrong. Now, he's now realized that he would like to actually do a little bit of learning to underpin what he's done in business. And I think that's great because he's not been dependent on the education. However, he's realized that there will be some, some benefit, added benefit to his business of going further and doing an MBA. So I think, I think it's, you know, as I said, I don't think we should be so stringent in our approach, because neither is right and neither is wrong. Yeah. I just feel that entrepreneurs know when they're going to be entrepreneurs. They just feel it. They feel it. Mm. <laughs> um, as a student who has always been passionate about politics, like some of our students, I've got one of the students who got to know that you'll be one of our next guest speakers, and uh, she has sent this question in earlier. Um, so she's studying something that has to do with um, with biology, but she's asking if she wants to start a, ca start a career in politics, is it still possible? So she's studying something completely different, yeah, with no background in politics, and is it would it still be possible? But why? Why? What do you need? I mean, I've often asked the question: Have you had seen a course on how do you become a prime minister, yes. or how have you seen a course on how do you become a cabinet minister? You don't see those courses. I think instinctively, you know, you are either a leader. And you have ideas and you have you have these sort of um, observations of life around you and you see what you need to improve on, what you need to change for the societal good. And those aren't courses. Those are instincts. Yeah. Right. 
And so, I, I, you know, when I became an energy minister, you know, somebody said, well, what do you know about energy? But it was, you know, I know what I want to see. And then it's for me to work with my, my brilliant officials to, to actually materialise that into something that becomes real. So I think I, I, to, to the student, you know, a grounding in anything is great. I mean, you know, she's got biology. So she will have a wide um, birth of um, a birth of information and knowledge that will actually add value to what is needed in politics today. We're becoming very high tech, very high knowledge. You know, so all of those things are ingredients to actually help societal rise rather than bring us down. Mm. And a final question. How important is it for students to be involved and play an active role in politics? So I say this to every single person, not just students. Every single person has a duty to know what's going on politically. And if you don't, what's happening across the world becomes more realistic. And that's frightening, because if we aren't there to be able to be able to challenge what we see as wrong, well, look around you. World politics is telling you yeah. it's becoming a very frightening place. Absolutely. Thank you, Barnes Rama. We'll now take a look at some of the questions we have received uh, from our viewers. So, first question is, having pursued a high-profile career, have you implemented any methods to cope with being in the public eye for your whole career? <laughs> it, that's a hard one because I don't think you're ever prepared for some of the the nastiness that comes yeah. um, you know you can do a lot of good but there are always people who want to see the negative in what you're doing yeah. do I preoccupy myself with that in the beginning it was painful mm. um, but as you get older I think I just became more cantankerous and less bothered, um, but it is painful. I think you've, you've got to accept that there will be times when people are just going to be mean and yeah. horrible to you. But it's, it's, uh, it's also not easy all the time to stay strong, isn't it? I mean, yeah. when, when people are mean, it's, uh, yeah, as a politician, it's, it's amazing how strong you stay and you still work for the purpose that you have. That yeah, you but like, the, like I said, that I then seek out my good friends and my good family who, who are a really good support mechanism. Yeah. But it, it, is, it can be quite painful. Um, and whilst, as a public figure, you can take the pain because you are out there, mm. it's difficult when it starts to impact on your family. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Our next question is, how important is it to maintain a healthy work-life balance as a politician and how do you do so? So, again, this is going to be one of those questions that I'm afraid I am, fa I am failing miserably on. And I fail miserably on it on, on a number of fronts. I cannot give up doing things until I believe that there are enough people doing them. And so I, I have to continue on this sort of fast train that I'm on and um, hope that as I'm doing it, I'm t bringing people along who will be there to take over when I'm not around any longer. Um, questions are coming through to our, to our viewers. Do keep sending questions. Some really good questions coming through. Um, so, so one of the next questions is, uh, looking back, you have, you have an impressive career. What goals have you still yet to accomplish professionally and how important is it to always look forward? So my, my goals are to make sure that I reach out to enough young people to be able to encourage them enough to, to, to reach out beyond what they believe that they can achieve. Because I honestly think most of us limit ourselves to our potential because we f like to feel safe. Yeah. And sometimes putting the head above the parapet, par parapet moment is always going to be difficult. But I just feel that there is just so much that needs changing. Climate change is coming and we're not doing enough about it. We're not doing m anywhere near the amount of work that we need to do to make opportunities equal for everyone. Yeah. 
Um, so there's so much to be done. And I just hope that one of the things I managed to achieve, even today, if I can leave today knowing that a few people will feel inspired to get up and do that little bit more in the public space, I will be incredibly happy. Our next question is, uh, what's this following up on your climate change that you've just mentioned? Um, is it more important than ever right now with growing concerns over climate change that everybody plays an active role in politics? Yeah, because I think, I think we haven't spoken enough about the absolute devastation that we are doing to our planet. I mean, you know, everybody, we talk about things like, you know, water, um, weather events, but we are degrading our soil at such a pace. We are going to have water shortages. We have population growth that is going to have to be managed at some point. We have, um, you know, there, there's this love affair for us to have quick, cheap things in the now. And we don't actually know what the stories behind that cheap product of today is going to impact on the landfill yeah. that we are piling all of this into. So I think the, the, we've got to start asking ourselves, rather than pointing the finger somewhere else, are they doing enough? Yeah. Maybe we should just look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we doing enough? Yeah. You know, Do we need to have so many more cheap products coming into our lives or are we able to manage on seasonal foods on seasonal things you know are we just now addicted to to not being able to say no to something that's quick and easy in front of us and you mentioned that it's something that we can all play an act play an active part in yeah and make a change yeah um next question is also about climate uh, under the current economic climate uh, what advice would you give to a young person to keep motivated? No, it wasn't about climate. I just saw the word climate. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's, you know, you turn on the news. It's depressing. You know, there is, there is war going on in the world. There is hunger going on in the world. Uh, there are a lot of challenges going on in the world. Now, I can sit there and be the pessimist, or I can sit there and say, Let, what, what part can I play? It may be a tiny part, but if, if we all gather with our tiny parts we suddenly become a big part. Absolutely. And I don't believe we should be destructive in our playing of our parts. We should be proactive. You know, let's start. Look in the mirror. What do I do individually? How do I get my community to join in? How do I get the wider society to join in? So I think there is something you can do. Yeah. Um, I have never, ever sort of said to myself, let me set a goal that I can't achieve. Mm. Let me set a goal that I can achieve, but let me achieve it well. Yeah. Can you share a story of a successful client campaign uh, other than create con... Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. That was a wrong question. Uh, a, a re the question has been rephrased here. What are some of the transferable skills you've applied in your, politi in your politics career from your fashion business? Listening. You know... If you're a business person, you need to know what the consumer needs. Do not try to sell the consumer something they don't need, but sell them something they want. Yeah. So in high fashion, I went into high fashion at a young age because I was a young person. I understood high fashion at the time, um, which is why I was probably better at it than my father, um, which is always very satisfying. When he took and he'll be proud of you. Well, he, yeah, I mean, he's in, he's in the heavens now. So he's looking down, smiling and thinking, you know, she's causing trouble still. But, but I think the, the interesting point is that, you know, transferable skills are ones where you're comfortable of being able to, you know, I look at what I learned, what I've learned over the years in business, which I still utilize. Would I do something that I would expect somebody else to do? And if I'm not prepared to do it myself, then my expectation for somebody else wouldn't be there. So I've always worked on the frame that, you know, I am quite happy in the, uh, when I was in, in my factories to get onto the, the factory floor, do the, get the broom and do the sweeping if I needed to do it. Yeah. Um, just as I would today in politics, go out there and be banging on doors and encouraging people to come out and join in trying to change the world. So you have the skills that you just utilize in different ways. Um, 
and never be frightened of challenging yourself. You know, it's lovely to see that you've actually done something that you didn't think you could. I've encouraged people to come into politics who never dreamt of coming into politics. Now that they're there, they enjoy it because they see the changes they can make. Same with business. That was our final question, by the way. Perfect. Baris Mama, you've been such an inspiration. Thank you so much thank uh, you. for sharing expertise and insights with, with us. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you for joining us today. We hope you have enjoyed this webinar. Uh, ECHO is back next week on the 25th of May at 1 p.m. BST with Raj Padan, CEO of Leica Media. He'll give us first-hand insights into today's broadcasting world. For more information, follow our YouTube channel, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everybody.